Unified Conferencing. Thank you for coming. So, first of all, we are on the same page. This is the Substance Exposed Entrance and Long Term Impact Symposium. And so, it's going to go between 11 30 and 1 p.m. We're going to be here together discussing. Uh, we have lots of fun guests actually today. So, it's going to be a very good day. I am excited. I am glad that you were able to make it. Uh, feel free to eat throughout the whole thing. Uh, it is a brown bag lunch. So, we will be just listening in, and uh, welcome to everybody on the polycom and on the phone as well. Uh, we are all, there is a lot more of us than the people here, and so we are glad you were all able to join us this morning. Uh, without further ado, I'm just going to get started. I just wanted to say thank you for coming and welcome, and I will start us by having um, the Commissioner of the Virginia Department of Health come and open us. Thank you, sir. So the camera's on the podium? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay, good. I don't want to stand with my back today. <laughs> um, so welcome uh, to everyone here in the room and to all of the, uh, the folks who've joined us on the uh, Polycom. Um, I think it's a very important event that we're going to be, a subject that we're going to be talking about at this event uh, over lunch. Uh, as you know, when I was appointed uh, State Health Commissioner, one of the things I did is I went on a statewide uh, tour across the Commonwealth talking to people, trying to find out what the big public health issues were. Uh, we're all very well aware of the opioid and addiction epidemic uh, across the state, and everywhere I went, that was a major, uh, major uh, topic, particularly in uh, some areas, uh, in far southwest Virginia, uh, has been ravaged by the opioid epidemic for quite some time, going back into the early, late 80s, early uh, 90s. One of the things that I became aware of there uh, quite acutely was the problem that is confronted uh, by uh, public health workers, uh, social workers, families, and others in Southwest Virginia dealing with the impact of that epidemic on infants and children. The uh, incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome in far southwest Virginia is, is astronomically uh, high. And one of the things that they were doing was building a collective impact uh, coalition involving health departments, the CSBs, hospital systems, social workers, and others, and trying to deal with that epidemic and planning for a safe uh, care uh, of these uh, infants and uh, of the families. Uh, in which these infants uh, were born. Um, the opioid epidemic isn't the only problem that, uh, I mean, NAS is not the only problem that results from the opioid epidemic, and in fact, the other drugs and substances that are being used. Uh, as uh, many of you are well aware, um, the um, epidemic that we see in this, uh, in this state and across the country is not just opioids, but other substances. And meth, for example, is uh, quite prevalent in raising its head once again uh, in the Commonwealth as well as other substances. Um, it results uh, not only in, in things like neonatal abstinence syndrome, but uh, in a really sharp increase in the number of uh, uh, infants and children who wind up in foster care. This has been a huge problem uh, that uh, we've been trying to address in sister agencies like the Department of Social Services, uh, and which is really strapped in trying to care for this real big peak uh, in um, uh, foster uh, children. 
It's also a problem for the families, I think. I, I, I believe that one of the things that we have to deal with is not just the medical issues of uh, uh, treating uh, women in, um, with substance use disorder for their uh, disease of addiction, but we also have to get at the root causes, uh, the sort of despair that is driving uh, these women to the use of uh, substances. And I think it's really important that we address some of these social conditions in which people live, work, and, and play that, that drives them to um, looking to substances as a way of trying to deal with that uh, despair. Uh, and we're going to have to address a lot of those issues. I, I, I remember Sue Cantrell, our um, uh, medical director at our Linda Wisco and Cumberland uh, Plateau um, Health Departments in far, far southwest uh, Virginia telling a story once of um, she, as some of you know, uh, does medication um, assisted treatment for people who have substance use disorder. And she talked about a woman, young woman, who uh, came to her wanting uh, treatment because she had found out that she uh, was pregnant and she wanted to be off of. Um, uh, oxycodone was her drug of choice uh, by the time the baby was born. And Sue accepted this patient and treated her, and she got off the drugs, and, and that she was quite happy about that. Um, <clears throat> she had another problem, of course, which is that she was uh, essentially homeless. She was couch surfing, and she was at the time living in her grandmother's house, and it was a home where there were a number of other people who were there, who, all of whom were using various substances. Um, and she was concerned that if she stayed in that household, she was going to relapse and uh, get back on, on drugs again. So she went to the sheriff and asked the sheriff to put her in jail, which the sheriff did. Um, and she stayed off of drugs the entire time. Uh, time of her pregnancy, but then when the baby was born, the sheriff couldn't keep her anymore. So she went back to grandma's house. One thing led to another. She wound up back in the sheriff's office, office uh, jail, uh, this time for committing some crime. Baby was off into foster care. And I would submit that the problem there was not her disease of addiction, but her lack of affordable housing. Um, just to underscore the point that we need to deal with the medical side of this, but we also need to deal with the social and economic side of this is with everyone to break um, this, uh, this epidemic. Because if it's not opioids, it's going to be something else. We've seen a decline, uh, a plateau in the number of opioid deaths, but um, if people are having this problem with um, opioids uh, because of this, their social conditions, they'll find other substances once we get control of opioids. Um, for folks on Polycom, uh, for the uh, rest of the um, session, please be sure to uh, put your uh, microphones on mute um, until we get to uh, questions and answers. Um, our keynote is going to be uh, uh, given by Dr. Uh, Wolf, Elizabeth Wolf. Uh, she's an assistant professor in general pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Richmond here at the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University Health System. Um, she got her MD at the University of Washington School of Medicine and joined the VCU faculty in August of 2015. Uh, she's active in the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, and received the 2016 Academic Pediatric Association Bright Futures Young Investigator Award from um, the APA. She's co-author of the APA's uh, um, or co chair, rather, of the APA's Region 4, and her research interests include improving attendance at well, care, well child care visits, vaccine preventable diseases, and uh, focusing on vulnerable populations. And I'd like to welcome her here today. Thank you. Not Robin Foster. I apologize. I just want to say that from the outset. Um, I do not have her decades of experience um, working with um, victims of child abuse and neglect. However, uh, Dr. Foster and I, um, as well as Dr. Nelson, who you may meet a little bit later, um, share interest in this population of substance abuse and, uh, and together have given um, a couple of courses uh, teaching providers 
um, and other people in the community about the effects of neonatal abstinence syndrome and then what happens to these children later on. So um, as Dr. Oliver said, I'm a general pediatrician and I'm also a public health researcher. So I, I wear two hats at VCU. And so I hope that in this talk I'll be able to give you um, a sense of, of both worlds, the public health perspective, the broader lens, and also a personal perspective from dealing with these families on a day-to-day -day basis. And feel free to interrupt me with any questions. Appreciation for me? <laughs> okay. So the objectives today are going to discuss the epidemiology of substance-exposed infants in this century, um, to understand the effects of substance exposure on infants and children, and to understand the concurrent risks of substance exposure in terms of comorbidities and abuse and neglect, and to describe some effective interventions and models that are being used across the country and in Richmond um, to help intervene. Um, so. As I begin, can you guys just raise your hands if you are a health provider of any kind? Okay, so I will stay away from jargon. <laughs> Try to, anyway. Um, and, and raise your hand if you've ever seen um, an infant affected with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Okay, quite a few, actually. Okay. Um, so this is a pretty broad term. It refers to a newborn who um, had a mother who's taking some sort of drug or substance. The presentation is quite variable. And um, it's not well understood in terms of the spectrum. But it's thought that between 55 and 94% of all exposed infants do exhibit some sort of symptom from withdrawal. Um, the most commonly associated medications are, are opioid um, medications or drugs, um, but can also occur from tobacco and psychotropic medications. And we see that frequently too. Even mothers who are uh, high use of tobacco, you see effects of withdrawal in those infants. A number of prescribed opioids, um, including oxycodone. Um, and then um, two at the bottom of the list, including methadone and buprenorphine, um, as well as suboxone, which we use for opioid replacement therapy. And NAS, or neonatal abstinence syndrome, can result from all of these, including the methadone and the, the buprenorphine derivatives. Um, and of course, there's also um, non prescribed opioids like heroin and increasingly fentanyl. Um, and of course, each of these drugs comes with its own set of problems, right? So um, if somebody is taking oxycodone, for example, well, they don't have the same risks necessarily for hepatitis C um, and HIV as somebody who's injecting here. Um, and then some of the psychotropic medications that some mothers with opioid use disorder um, also use include the common SSRI antidepressant medications like Zoloft or Prozac, um, and some of the other ones uh, like SNRIs and benzodiazepines. Um, so this is a chart of um, the incidence and also costs associated with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, and it's broken down by pair. So you can see the upper line is Medicaid, um, and the squares are all pairs. Um, and then the bottom line is private insurance. Um, and you can see that the incidence has risen steadily in the last 15 years. And when I was looking at the statistics, it's estimated that the incidence of NAS actually increases by between 10 and 20% every year. And that has been true at BC. Here we had about just 150 cases here of VCU alone. Um, this is the chart for Virginia. This is your own data. Um, and, um, and you can see that these state-level trends follow the national trends quite well. So some general manifestations of neonatal abstinence syndrome include fever um, or temperature instability, yawning, sneezing, sweating, um, nasal stuffiness and congestion, they can have fast breathing, um, and also modeling. Um, and I put a picture of modeling on the lower right side of the screen. I don't know if you can see it. It's that lacy rash. It kind of looks like diffuse blood vessels. Um, and that's, that's what we mean when we say the word modeling. Of course, a lot of these symptoms, they can be other things, too. They don't necessarily have to be neonatal abs. An infant who has sepsis, for example, an infection of the bloodstream, well, they could also have fever, um, and they could also have modeling. 
Um, so you have to think about all these things when you're seeing an infant with um, opioid exposure. Um, there's also some gastrointestinal manifestations of NAS, including vomiting, regurgitation, loose stools. Um, and the loose stools are, are important for two reasons. Um, one is that um, these children, they lose a lot, of, um, a lot of the milk through the stools, and so they have increased metabolic um, demands from their stiff posturing, but also because they're losing calories through their stools. And the second reason that the loose stools are important is that these children get horrific diaper rashes. Um, and we even, they're, they're so bad that we actually get the burn nurses involved um, because they can be very hard to control. And then, of course, you have exposed skin, um, and those children um, may develop infections. Um, children can also have poor feeding. Um, they can experience so much stress um, and so much clenching of the muscles that it's actually hard for them to coordinate their muscles in order to feed properly. Um, and some of these children uh, need have, to have a nasogastric tube placed in their nose to give them milk that way. Um, they can also have excessive suck, sucking um, in, in an attempt to try to soothe themselves. Um, and there's also several neurological manifestations of NAS, including tremors, um, high-pitched crying, sleep disturbance, increased muscle tone, excoriation. So what that means is these infants, in addition to having the terrible diaper rash that I was describing, they're, they're often sort of clawing at their face, for lack of a better word, um, and, and they can actually have scrapes on their chin that will also become abraded. Um, they can have jerking movements, they can have irritability, and even seizures, although I've never seen seizures. Um, and so the bottom line is that these babies with NIS are challenging. And they're not just challenging in the newborn period, but they're, and we'll talk about this later, but they're challenging throughout um, early childhood. And so it's very, very important to train whoever is going to be taking care of the child, if it's the biologic parent or if it's a foster parent, um, to try to soothe these babies in any way that you can. And uh, there's this technique called the, the five S's, um, provided by Harvey Karp, who wrote The Happiest Baby on the Block. Have you guys heard of that before? Yeah. Um, you don't have to buy the book. I'm going to give away the secret right now. Um, it's The five S's are swaddling. So wrapping the baby so that they can't have that startle reflex, um, putting the baby on, on their side, of course, while they're awake, not when they're sleeping, because side sleeping is uh, a risk for an infant death syndrome, um, swinging, um, sucking on something like a buckler, um, and, and the shushing sound. So that white noise, which you can get in a white noise machine, um, you can use a white noise app on your phone, all these things can help soothe infants. Um, and so when we're in the hospital taking care of these babies, we're trying to decide, okay, which of these babies actually needs medication to help their withdrawal symptoms? Because they've been exposed to an opioid, in the case of opioid-associated NAS, you know, for potentially nine months of that pregnancy. And then they're, they're taken out of mom, and they're going through some pretty intense withdrawal. So what sort of scoring systems do we use? The, the most classic is the Finnegan scoring system. Um, that's the most commonly used scoring system across the country. I will say that VCU is part of a, a UNC study. We're going to be actually moving to a different scoring system, but right now this is what's used, and it's what's used in most hospitals. Um, and what we're looking for is for the score to be higher than eight, eight or higher, um, on three consecutive measurements. And those are typically the infants who are going to be started on, in our institution, methadone, um, but in other places they'll use more. Um, and so this. You can see the writing's a little small here, but these are some of the things that are used to score the infant. So a high-pitched cry, problem sleeping, tremors, um, temperature, like we were talking about, and loose stools. Um, and so the NAS scoring, um, it should be performed after the infant is fed so that you're not sort of penalizing the infant for being hungry, right? You want to optimize them with the five S's and with feeding. Um, and if they're still scoring high, then they're going to get the high Finnegan score. Um, and as we were talking about with the five S's, there are a number of different non-pharmacological treatments that one can employ to try to soothe the infant who's undergoing withdrawal. So you can have a dark room, you can have it be quiet with the white noise. Um, we, we like to have the infant room in with the mother, if at all possible. 
there's some good evidence to suggest that that will improve outcomes with NAS. However, um, we do have mothers who are incarcerated where the mothers go back to jail and infants remain with us in the hospital and rooming in is not always possible after they go back. Um, um, some of the swaddling kangaroo care just refers to skin to skin, um, which not only helps with their temperature and stability, um, but it can also help soothe them. Um, and you can use rocking, swinging, sucking, like we were talking about, massage, and even music. Um, so nationally, about 60 to 80 percent of children with NAS require medications for withdrawal. Um, at BCU, it's actually a little bit better. I think it's close to 30 percent. Um, um, and so we try to use these non-pharmacological means. Um, and this, this is also, these are older figures. Um, and I think it's very important to stress that the need for medications is not a failure of the mother or a failure of the treatment program or of, or of the provider. It just happens. We can't predict. But some of these infants will need methadone or morphine in order to help their withdrawal symptoms. Um, and this third point came um, from one of the talks we were giving out in the community. I think it's important to stress that the hospital, by giving the methadone or the morphine, is not making the babies addicted. They're already addicted to opioids. Um, they are actively withdrawing from these medications, and they require help weaning. Um, so some of the treatment options, um, morphine and methadone are the most common. Um, buprenorphine is starting to be used, um, and I think you may see that more in the next 10 years. Um, in terms of feeding, um, breastfeeding is encouraged if there's no illicit drug use, so no heroin use, and there's no HIV. Um, moms with hepatitis C actually can breastfeed as long as they do not have cracked nipples. Um, and the breastfeeding, um, it helps with that skin-to-skin -skin contact as well. Um, we are feeding these infants on demand with frequent and small feedings to try to reduce that amount of regurgitation. And if formula is used, you might need a higher, um, a higher density of formula, so higher cal caloric density, because, like I was saying, they have higher metabolic demands from being so tense. Um, so um, this is a more lengthy slide, but all of it to say is that breastfeeding um, can be an important adjunct to helping these infants in the newborn period. I had a mother who was involved in a methadone program, and one day um, she had missed her methadone dose. I don't remember what happened, but she didn't make it to the clinic. And you could actually tell that infant was withdrawing much more that day, and the scores were a lot higher because they weren't getting the methadone through the breast milk. Um, this is a very interesting slide. I know you can't read it, but I'll just break it down for you. This is the number of days for an average infant receiving treatment for NAS. So the median length of stay is 16 days, right? So a typical newborn, they're staying in the hospital about two days, you know, in and out, constant turnover. But for the kids with neonatal abstinence syndrome, they're there for 16 days. And some of them there, I mean, we've had them there up to five or six weeks even, um, because sometimes it takes a long, long time to wean them from the methadone that they're being treated with. Um, and the timing of the withdrawal just depends on what type of opioid the mom is using. So heroin, the withdrawal tends to be faster, between 24 and 48 hours, uh, methadone, three to five days, and then buprenorphine, about 72 hours. We do not, if, if we know that an infant is opioid exposed, we don't let them leave the hospital earlier than 96 hours, because we want to be able to catch those children who may be withdrawing later on. Um, and then, so we, we've talked about the, some of the short-term problems in dealing with these infants, right? The diarrhea, the fussiness, um, the feeding problems. Um, and when researchers have tried to look at long-term outcomes, it has been more challenging. Um, and it's really for many different reasons. Um, I love this slide. Uh, it really says a lot. There's no ability to perform randomized control trial, right? You can't say, um, you know, this, we're going to expose this baby to opioids and we're going to not expose this baby to opioids. Like, that doesn't fly, right? <laughs> it's, it's why you can't study breastfeeding in that way either. Um, and, and so when you think about it, infants who are exposed to opioids, they differ. Um, and a lot of the social risk factors from infants who are not exposed to opioids. So um, mothers may have lower education, um, 
you know, there might be higher rates of poverty, homelessness, mental illness, all these things. So it's very hard to untangle what is due to the opioid and what is due to some of these other social factors. Um, I will say that, you know, there's a huge range of families that we see here, and I don't mean to lump everybody together. So you have the families, you know, you have the mom who's, um, you know, doing great, um, has been in treatment for years, and is on a stable dose of either methadone or buprenorphine. Okay, that's one end of things. You know, the other end of things is a mom who is homeless and has schizophrenia and is actively using heroin up until the day of delivery, um, and we see everything in between. It's also a problem because different places measure NAS in different ways. Different states measure NAS in different ways from other states. Um, and there's really very few longitudinal long-term studies. Um, so I see Dr. Foster is here now. So I think I may turn it over to her sure. at this point because she's less of an expert. Than you Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. I'm so sorry. I was um, in criminal court for a child abuse case, and the case was extended. In fact, the poor jury is going to be there until Saturday now, is what they're being told. Um, so we're going to look a little bit now about um, what sort of happened at a national level um, in terms of initiatives to try to get more information, because like Liz said, we're having a really hard time understanding the long-term effects, because there's no sort of uniform collection of data. So um, in August of 2017, the Behavioral Health Coordinating Council Subcommittee on Prescription Drug Use um, submitted this report to Congress. Um, there was a law that came in 2015 mandating that Health and Human Services conduct a review and make recommendations for the prevention of prenatal substance abuse and the prevention, recognition, and treatment of MAS. This law, though, did not include funding for these recommendations, right? So we need to do something, but after we've looked at the kind of issues that these kids are dealing with, even when you look at hospitalization costs, that you know there's a lot of costs that are associated with that. Um, and you can access, <coughs> excuse me, this report at SAMHSA. So on these slides, there's a little link to go to that report. So HHS right now has multiple data sets that are utilized to obtain accurate information. SAMHSA uses the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the Treatment Episode data set, the National Survey of Substance Abuse Treatment Services, and then the Administration for Children and Families uses the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System, or NCANS, and then Adoption and Foster Care Analysis and Reporting System. And then the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and the CDC also carries information about pregnancy risk assessment and monitoring. So there's lots of big data sets out there. And then the Protecting Our Infants Act, Act reports that really the identification and intervention in substance abuse is significantly limited by the lack of adoption of ESPERT. So ESPERT is screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. It's a validated screening process and intervention modality for many patient issues. It's, re it's recommended by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the AAP, the AA AMA, based on very promising evidence of effectiveness. And you know, there's lots of screening tools out there right now, and you worry about how many screening tools we're using. But when this has been applied, it's been very effective. And pregnancy has been found to be a, a very unique state for all these moms, right? It's a state of huge biological and social transformation for this mother, and really a period of vulnerability where people believe that an intervention at that point in time may be the most effective period of time to intervene. Um, but the absence of flexible screening tools for pregnant women then limits the efficacy of this approach. And there's several different screening tools out there, um, and this just lists two of them so that you can reference in terms of trying to apply some kind of universal screening. There's also a lack of systematic protocol-driven screening and assessment for NAS in the infant. Liz talked about in our newborn nursery. Uh, Tiffany Kim Kimbrough is the director of our newborn nursery. She has been very invested in this patient population. I think the physicians, including Dr. Nelson, who just entered the room, all staff the newborn nurseries, as does Dr. Wolf. They spend a lot of time evaluating these kids. So we end up with about 150 kids per year in our nursery. 
um, <clears throat> that are evaluated for substance exposure and meticulously screened. But that kind of process varies all over the place because nobody does universal screening in terms of looking for substances in the child's system, right? Except for one place in the state of Virginia, which is Winchester Hospital. Uh, but the rest of us don't do that. Um, so from hospital to hospital, that variability is huge. And so then are some of these NAS cases missed because that kid's already been discharged at 48 hours of age, right? And we talked about the onset of these symptoms can be at day three or day four. Um, so there's a lack of monitoring. There's variability in reporting ICD codes for both the mom and the infant. So if somebody tries to go and pull all the medical records, those ICD codes may not really tell us what's going on. And then there are different reporting requirements and laws in each state. So even when CAPTA, at the federal government letter le level, tried to say, look, we've got to start keeping track of all these infants, that's not really happening the same way across the country. Um, there's a lack of consensus regarding what um, outcome measures um, for these interventions should be used. And then even federal databases like NCANS and the Adoption and Foster Care Analysis and Reporting System have not necessarily defined in their reports what was the prenatal substance exposure specifically? What type was it? So the recommendations are we need to standardize data collection and survey. We need to expand the implementation of ESPER to screen all of our pregnant women, not test all of them, right? That would be hard. That would be uh, a huge undertaking, and I'm not sure yield the effect that we want. But you at least need to screen them and then provide appropriate resources and then clearly define the screening, diagnosis, and assessment of that infant after the infant is born. So what do we know? Liz talked about the fact that we can't give one baby opioids and the other baby not, right, and figure out how that affects them in that perinatal period. But they have done that on animals, right? So that's where all the research started, at animal-based. So how do these exposures affect animal brains? Because then we can compare two populations that we know otherwise all the other factors are controlled for where we don't have that ability in people. And so when they looked at prenatal oxycodone exposure, they found that it does definitely alter at, at, the, at the neurologic level receptors in neonatal rats. So endothelial receptors affect normal central nervous system development of a rat, um, and also humans in that sense. So rats who were exposed to oxycodone in the prenatal period had a much higher number of these receptors and those rats exposed to oxycodone had many more congenital malformations that include the face, the mouth, the vertebra, and demonstrated interuterine growth retardation. So what does that mean? Not growing normally in the way that we expect during that period in the womb. That was published in 2015. And then this is also another animal study that looked at perinatal exposure to uh, subutex and found that it directly affects the myelination in the developing brain. So oligodendrocytes are the cells, um, myelinating cells in the brain, and they have opioid receptors too. So they can be affected when opioids are on board. And pregnant rats who were exposed to buprenorphine daily in a dose-dependent fashion, those opioids dis disrupted the activity of those myelin basic proteins and the subsequent myelination process, or at the bottom, at the end of the day, development of that rat's brain. So we know at an animal level, when everything else is controlled for, there are definite biological effects of being exposed to those opioids. But let's talk about what we know in terms of the patients themselves, human patients, how do different drugs affect these patients when they come out of the womb? What do we see in terms of comparing these groups of babies? So we're going to start not with opioids, we're going to start with alcohol. How many people think alcohol is the worst thing that a kid can be exposed to? That's right. It is alcohol. So it was first described <clears throat> a long time ago, in 1973, by Jones et al., and described as fetal alcohol syndrome. So a lot of times you hear that terminology used. But they've actually given us a new term that's sort of a broader basket than fetal alcohol syndrome called alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. So, Fetal alcohol syndrome was defined back in the 70s as a constellation of features in infants who were born to alcoholic mothers. So they had these marked facial and physical abnormalities. A lot, the, sort of the most common are these facial features where they have a very flat philtrum. They don't have that normal curvature over, above their lips. 
Um, they had pre- and postnatal growth deficiencies, so they were also had interuterine growth retardation and then difficulty developing afterwards, and central nervous system abnormalities. And the rate of fetal alcohol syndrome in the U.S. today is about one to three per thousand live births. And the rate of alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder is 10 to 30 per thousand births. Do people get diagnosed with this when they're in our newborn nursery, though? Absolutely not, right? Because, why? Because the half-life of alcohol is so short that unless somebody in the family or unless the mom comes in acutely intoxicated at the time of delivery, we have no idea that that was what the causation was of those child's abnormalities, even if we do notice abnormalities at that point in time. So it is by far the most common cause of mental retardation in the United States and in all other developed countries across the world. In the last 30 years, there have been 5,000 articles in print regarding the effects of alcohol exposure to fetuses. Alcohol is a teratogen. It kills things and messes up normal growth and development at all levels, molecular, cellular, and at tissue levels. In 1996, the Institute of Medicine further defined the criteria and proposed this new term that we talked about, which doesn't require the facial or physical findings, but can have structural CNS abnormalities and cognitive abnormalities. Um, and in 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, on Substance Abuse published a report regarding this. And so alcohol freely crosses the placenta and the blood-brain barrier, so that's why it's so toxic to the fetus, because it goes right in. And then there are indirect effects when the alcohol starts breaking down, the metabolites can also affect the child. It affects hormonal balance, it affects neurochemical balance, and neurophysiologic sy symptoms that regulate that normal brain growth. So kids can end up with a whole laundry list of things, a lot of which are central nervous system involved. Right? And so those things, those kids will certainly benefit from intervention and resources, but those things aren't really reversible when we're talking about structural CNS abnormalities. So small head, small brain, um, neuronal abnormalities at a microscopic level. So there's a whole laundry list of things that can directly be present only because of the exposure to alcohol and nothing else. And then what do we see in those kids in terms of their function? They have poor fine motor skills, they may have poor balance, abnormal gait, hearing loss, poor hand-eye coordination, and hypotonia. They may be those floppy kids that don't have good tone. They have learning disabilities, decreased IQ scores compared to their control patients, attention deficit disorder is much more uh, common when there's been alcohol exposure. Problems with memory, problems in social perceptions, deficits in both receptive and expressive language. So alcohol really hits almost everything that's important to us in the development of that child, both physically and in their cognitive development. And then it also carries over into increasing the risk of adult mental illness. So there's an increased risk in that patient population as adults of alcohol and drug dependence, of psychotic disorders, of antisocial or dependent personality disorders, and a higher risk of depression and suicide. These are some of the other related birth defects that are directly related to it that include the eye, the ear, and the endocrine axis. So how, why does it affect and sort of what are the bad things about it? So it's not the length of exposure, but what the peak concentrations are. So somebody that binge drinks, is much more likely to have a constellation of these side effects than somebody that's drinking a, one glass of wine a day and never has these higher peak levels in their bloodstream. Cessation of drinking prior to the second trimester is very helpful. Um, the cerebellum, which is back here and affects your gait and balance, is particularly susceptible to alcohol during the third trimester. Heavy alcohol consumption during the first trimester, you end up with a lot of cranial facial abnormalities. And then microcephaly, which just means a small head, is dose-dependent and is mostly occurs secondary to high exposures late in the gestation, right? Because that's when our brain is growing and developing. You've done all your dividing and you have sort of the basic structure, but that's when the brain does all of its growth. And what do kids look like when they're born with, and go through alcohol withdrawal? 
So unfortunately, it's not very specific, right? It could be accountable for a lot of other things. So they may have a low blood sugar, which is hypoglycemia. They may be irritable and have tremors, so they may look like a child that's going through opioid withdrawal. They can have seizures in alcohol withdrawal. They have temperature instabilities, blood pressure abnormalities. So a lot of these things have a crossover with other substances, right? So if alcohol is being used in the context of something that we can test for, we may assume that that was the drug that was causing it instead of alcohol. So how do we help intervene since a lot of these things that we just went through the list of are not things that we can really change except to offer support and services. So abstinence is definitely recommended for pregnant women. And so that education process and that knowledge that you have now of what the long-term effects can be on the child is critical for the mom to understand that that can have that direct effect. Because a lot of people see changes in be be mom's behavior when they're pregnant, but I don't think alcohol is probably the one that most moms think is the worst act, right, in terms of what's on board in their system. So high quality education regarding the effects of the alcohol is imperative. Supportive program for identified moms. So what if she's had one infant that ends up with this diagnosis? Then how do we help intervene and say, let you know, how can we help you during this next pregnancy? So she needs much more intensive services during that next preg pregnancy in terms of preventing that from happening again. And then early intervention in terms of the infant themselves is imperative. Um, so that you can improve that infant's outcome by offering early intervention services and a lot of support in the family. Cocaine. So co cocaine was around, right, and sort of peaked in the 80s, but we are seeing a lot more positive cocaine screens in our nursery right now. A lot of times in the context of using with opioids, much like back in the 80s, um, but much more so than it was a few years ago. So cocaine does not cause a classic withdrawal syndrome like the opioids that we can score. Um, in the 80s during the crack ep epidemic, epidemic, there were many assumed sort of outcomes of interuterine cocaine exposure that didn't really bear out. So people thought it was horrible as a, a perinatal exposure. There was a lot of press around it. But since then, a lot of work has been done to try to really quantitate. And so it does have effects, and we're going to run through those, but it's not sort of what people used to talk about in the 80s, if anybody else is as old as I am. Does anybody else still use this drug? Yes, we talked about that. And where are we today in terms of what effects does it cause, since our state code says that if we're going to provide services and intervene in this infant's behalf, then they have to be affected by that substance they were exposed to. So it's really under important for us to understand if we have a mom that's cocaine positive, but the baby doesn't have classic withdrawal symptoms, is that child going to be affected? So this article came out in 2008. The University of Pittsburgh did some work on looking at the effects of prenatal cocaine use on infant development. Um, so it looked at physical, cognitive, and motor development. And so when they were doing their work, they started trying to figure out what's the baseline use of cocaine out in the world today. And um, in 2003, a National Household Survey found that it was about 5% of women had used in the last year. The National Pregnancy and Health Survey said 1% of all pregnant women used. A rural study in Florida said 2.6. An urban study in Boston said 18% of pregnant women used. And then a current, the current data from this longitudinal prospective study here said that the bare baseline rate is about 8% of all pregnant women. So there are multiple inconsistencies in the literature in the past about what it, what it does and doesn't do. Um, and the reasons for those inconsistencies were a failure to control differences in the demographic because a lot of women who use cocaine have what? They have a lot of health issues and they have a lot of nutrition issues, right? So their nutrition issues may also have an effect on that pregnancy, not just simply the cocaine. The amount of prenatal care they had, the amount of alcohol they drank or marijuana or tobacco they used in context with that cocaine, the methods that were utilized to ascertain their drug use, did you just ask her how much she used, or were you actually tracking her on a prospective basis all during her pregnancy, and then recall bias when it's a retrospective study and people are reporting their use. And then, of course, as in all studies, attrition and dropout rates, right? A lot of these studies, when we're trying to track these children long-term now, 
we're losing 50% of what our, our study group is. And so they looked at a large prenatal clinic with users and non-users, and the information on drug use was collected prospectively. So they're collecting it each trimester when the mom's coming in for her visits. And the information included type and quantity and included whether they used alcohol, marijuana, or tobacco with the drug. And then they also collected data on their home environment and lifestyle as well. So they're trying to get all those other multifactorial things. And over a four-year period of time, 295 women were enrolled and 261 women were retained through the infant's first birthday, which is pretty good, right? Four infants died, four mothers lost custody of their infant and were lost to follow up, and then 2% or five of the kids were still followed, but they were no longer in mom's custody. They were in the custody of a different caretaker. And the characteristics of the moms who were using, in terms of sort of general, were older, Afro-American, not employed or currently in school, lower socioeconomic status, and more likely also to use alcohol and marijuana concomitantly with the cocaine. 55% of the cocaine users smoked marijuana versus 17% of the non-cocaine users smoked marijuana. And two drinks per day for cocaine users versus 0.4 drinks per day for non-users. And so what did it ended up looking? So when they were exposed in the first trimester, the prematurity rates for exposed versus unexposed was 10% versus 3%. Low birth rate rates were 12% versus 5%. Lower psychomotor development index scores or infant characteristic questionnaire, which is our Brazelton assessments, which are all looking at the CNS motor maturity behavior of these kids, um, all had some variability um, in terms of exposed versus unexposed. In moms who used throughout the pregnancy, though, if they used through all three trimesters, these findings were much more pronounced. So these kids were assessed at 12 months, okay? So they were assessed at birth. We just talked about that. They were assessed at 12 months. So do they look any different at 12 months? So it was not predictor. It was not a predictor of growth. So we saw that kids were more likely to be small for age when they were born, but not so at 12 months. So that went away. And then it was not a predictor of performance on the Bailey scale of infant development, but the use of alcohol was, but cocaine was not. And then prenatal cocaine exposure, especially in the second semester, was a predictor of lower psychomotor development index scores. And then prenatal cocaine exposure, especially in the second and third trimester, was a predictor of a poor score on the infant characteristic score. So why? Because these infants were much more fussy and much more difficult to provide care for. So that's a disaster, right? So that's a huge stressor on our moms, and it affects what? It affects attachment to that infant, and it affects the long-term health and well-being of that infant if, because we already know that colicky infants, based on the literature and the child abuse literature, are at a much higher rate of things like abusive head trauma than the sweet, happy baby that's so much easier to care for. So we worry, even if this is only a short-term effect, we worry about the number of resources that we need to allocate to those moms because this is not an easy baby for anybody to take care of. I've picked up infants upstairs in our nursery when they're fussy and irritable, and we have volunteer rockers that, that soothe these babies. But I'll sit there and try to soothe that baby, and it is hard for me, an educated person with a strong support system, and this isn't my baby, do you know what I mean? To feel like I'm being helpful at all to that infant when they sit there crying incessantly at me for 10 minutes, right? This would be stressful for any of us, much less our mom that's struggling with lots of other things going on. So there's poor brain maturity on EEG sleep studies at birth and one year when they looked at the 12-month assessment. Um, there's an association of second trimester use and poor motor development. It's unclear what the effect of only third trimester use was because no one in this study only used during that last trimester. People frequently, fortunately, don't develop drug habits at the end of their pregnancy. They're trying to get rid of it. Um, so what kind of brain effects does prenatal cocaine exposure? There are also 
animal studies out there about prenatal cocaine exposure, and just like we saw in opioids, it disrupts a lot of things in the central nervous system. So that's why we see all these downstream effects after the infant is born. And then they also came back a year later and published this because they, they tracked these same kids out until they were three years of age, okay? And so at three years of age, how did these kids look compared to their controls? Their head circumferences were smaller than the control group, which makes us worry that their brain doesn't have as much robust development. They had decreased scores on their short-term memory test. There were more internal and external behavior problems on their child behavior checklist. They were more fussy and more difficult on that ICQ score, just like they were at one year of age. And instead of these behaviors dissipating or abating in between one and three years of age, they were worse. Do you know what I mean? Those differences were more pronounced by three years of age. So now we're going to talk about opioids. We got a half hour? Okay. All right. So there's a lot of articles, not quite as much as on alcohol exposure, but there's over 1,300 articles in peer reviewed journals on opioid use during pregnancy. So a lot of people have spent a lot of time looking at what are the effects of opioid. And there's a lot of NIH, federal level funded research um, with large scale clinical trials, uh, looking at uh, the safety and efficacy of maternal and prenatal exposure to methadone and uh, buprenorphine. And they actually found that Subutex treatment during pregnancy is safe and may have advantages to methadone, which is why you started seeing now that there's a switch over from methadone, which has been around forever, to Subutex. The NIH has funded research regarding neonatal complications associated with prenatal opioid exposure. Opioid pain reliefs are commonly prescribed during pregnancy, but their association with neonatal outcome is poorly described. This study out of Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt partnered with the Tennessee Department of Health and was published in Pediatrics in 2015 about prescription opioid epidemic and infant outcomes by Dudley et al. So this data was taken from the Tennessee Medicaid program for three years, from 2009 to 2011. And they took random cases of NAS that were validated by medical record review. And they looked at the association of antenatal, before the baby was born, exposure, and neonatal abstinence syndrome being diagnosed um, using multivariable logistic regression. And they looked at over 112,000 pregnant women 31,000 of those women had filled at least one prescription for an opioid during their pregnancy. That's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Over 8,000 women used within the last 30 days prior to uh, pregnancy, and most of those, 94% of those, were short-acting opioids, and then 12,000 women received greater than a seven-day supply during their pregnancy. So, uh, so the data is all comers out of Tennessee Medicaid, right? So it's not private insurers, it's not HMO stuff, but it's all those Medicaid. Now, I'd also like to remind you that Tennessee is truly the hotspot, right, for this problem. One of my colleagues that did her residency up here is down struggling in Tennessee trying to intervene in all these cases, right? So these numbers probably reflect magnitude, but that's a good place to look, do you know what I mean? Because we're going to be able to track a larger population of kids in terms of what their outcomes are. Um, so moms with opioid use in the study were more likely to have depression, anxiety disorder, tobacco use, headaches or migraines, or also during this period of time prescribed an SSRI, which Liz already talked about briefly, right, that SSRIs are one of our antidepressants and have uh, cumulative effects along with opioids in terms of the outcome on the child. Um, infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome or opioid exposure compared to unexposed infants were more likely to have low birth weight. And, and so this is three groups, okay? Because one group is neonatal abstinence syndrome, one group is opioid exposure but without documented or diagnosed withdrawal, and then the last group is the control. So low birth rate, Respiratory diagnoses were higher, feeding difficulties, seizures, and the only um, illness that they looked at that had comparable rates between those three groups is necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a disease of preterm infants in their gut, where they lose blood supply to their gut. 
But all these other things had statistically significant differences. The, how many of these kids were diagnosed with NAS, and, and so what sort of were the risk factors for that? So out of the 112,000 infants, 1,000 of those infants were diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome. So 701 of those mothers had at least one prescription during the pregnancy. And in the study period between 2009 and 2011, in those three years, the rate of NAS rose from six per 1,000 births to 10.7 per 1,000 births. So any, even in that three-year period, we're on a curve that's steeply going upwards. And then the risk of NAS based on the type of opioid. Does it matter what opioid you're taking in terms of whether that child ultimately ends up having neonatal abstinence syndrome? So maintenance opioids, 29.3%. Long-acting, so that's like Subutex methadone, right? So those moms that are in maintenance treatment programs, it's a great thing that that child is at an increased risk based on this study to have NAS then. And then, People that were on long-acting opioids like oxymorphone extended release, 14.7%, and then somebody that broke their wrist while they were pregnant and got a three-day prescription of oxycodone for this acute injury, their risk was 1.4%. So it varies based on the drug type, the cumulative opioid exposure over time, and whether the mom was smoking cigarettes concurrent with that. So if we looked at relative risk, oxycodone, 10 milligrams, Q6 hours for five weeks, no tobacco, no SSRIs, the probability of delivering a neonatal abstinence syndrome infant was 0.011. If you took Subutex daily for 25 weeks and smoked a pack a day and took an SSRI, the probability of delivering a neonatal abstinence infant was 0.366. So folds more based on length of exposure and the character and uh, duration of the drug in the system. 65% of the infants that were diagnosed were exposed to legally obtained opioids. Polysubstance use is common in NAS and the withdrawal signs may not be just attributed to the opioid alone. The current recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics is that all opioid exposed infants be observed in the hospital for four to seven days. <coughs> But we've got to figure out who those kids are, right? And so if we don't have uniform way to screen the mom with those experts, then some of these kids are going to be sent home at day two, and that withdrawal is happening at home. That is a huge risk, not only for the well-being, health and well-being of that child in terms of the withdrawal physically, but the interaction then between that mom and child during that withdrawal behavior. Infants may be able at some point in time to be risk stratified into low risk and high, high risk when we better understand some of that data we just discussed about if you're on oxycodone for three days, then our risk is so low that do we really need to keep you for four days? Maybe not. But that study out of Tennessee is probably the first set of data that started giving us that information, so we're probably not ready to move to that yet, but that would be a great place to go to. Um, and then... In Washington State, they did this really great study, which is where Liz knows, Dr. Wolf knows who did the study, because she was out at Washington for her fellowship at Seattle Children's. And so this was a cohort study where they followed kids from 1990 to 2008, and they looked at kids who were diagnosed when they were born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, and they ended up with 1,900 kids. And then they matched them by birth year to 12,283 children who were unexposed. So no exposure, no withdrawal, unexposed infants. And they looked at two measures. They looked at the number of times those kids were re-hospitalized after birth, and they looked at their mortality in the first year of life only. The hospitalizations were up to um, five years of life, I think. But the mortality was just in the first year of life. So readmission to the hospital in the first five years of life, those kids with neonatal abstinence syndrome, 21.3% versus the unexposed kids, 12.7%. So even if you adjusted for things like maternal age, maternal education, gestational age of the child, smoking, this was still a very statistically significant number, that more of these kids were coming in sick to the hospital in those first five years of life. When you look at what they had, 
They had twice as many infectious diseases, twice as many, I'm sorry, three times as many CNS diseases of the central nervous system, twice as many respiratory complaints, three times as many digestive complaints, twice as many asphyxia. What does that mean? That's like our unsafe sleep kids, right, who suffocate. And six, greater than six times incidence of child abuse and neglect in that patient population. And that's not risk-adjusted numbers like we did on the previous slide. So that's not taking into account the mom's age or the gestational age of the infant. Or mom's education, all those same risk factors. That's not adjusted numbers. And then what was the proposed causation of these increased admission rates? So Biological changes induced by NAS, which we've already looked at. We know that they are out there and exist. What is the environment in terms of the psychosocial and physical environment that those children are living in? And less preventive care, which I think is really super important for us to examine in the state of Virginia, right? Because when a child goes home with the diagnosis of neonatal abstinence syndrome, they are no longer a well child, right? So our definition in the state of Virginia of medical neglect is when you don't bring a child in for their health care when they're sick with some kind of medical or surgical issue. But when we discharge infants home in the state of Virginia with the diagnosis of neonatal abstinence syndrome, after all that data that we just looked at, is that a well child or is that a child that carries a medical diagnosis that requires in not just regular follow-up, but intensive follow-up, right? So I want to turn that lens on well ch children check. I don't think anybody that's sent home with a diagnosis from their newborn nursery of neonatal abstinence syndrome should be sent home as a well child because they're not. We need to be providing them the best care to mitigate the risk factors that they have for all these things that we're looking at. But instead, these are our moms that most frequently get lost to follow up when we discharge them home. But we've got to figure out a way to help guide them back into the system and coordinate that medical care for the child to improve this outcome. So when you look at when did they get readmitted, this makes it even easier because the vast majority of these readmissions were in that first year of life. Right? So that's really, a, to me, and what I see as a pediatric emergency medicine physician as well, when do the di disasters come in? Is that first year of life. When do unsafe sleep deaths come in? That first year of life. So 61% of these readmissions were in that first year of life. Even though it was tracked to age five, I think we've got to think about resources being allocated and concentrated in that first year of life. So what about mortality? And that just means up to 12 months of age. So if you looked at the unadjusted rate, right, if we didn't account for gestational age or maternal age or maternal education, the infants that had neonatal abstinence syndrome, 1% of them died in the first year of life. And the kids that were the control group that were not exposed, 0.29%. So this actually, when you adjusted for all these things, didn't reach statistical significance. But the, it's close. And the reason is because our numbers are pretty small compared to the larger number of readmission rates that we were looking at. That's a much bigger N. We're looking at a small N in terms of mortality. If we had a bigger pool to look at, I am very concerned that this number would become very statistically significant. So when we talk about outcomes, this is the worst of all outcomes. And there's a big difference when you just look at raw numbers and don't adjust them. And there's a slight difference when you adjust the numbers and it's getting close to statistically significant. So we've got to look at larger pools of kids to show that there is a significant risk to these kids in terms of mortality. And this Washington study came out of a study that was actually done in Australia before it. And the Australian health system is very different than our health system. So it's sort of more like apples and oranges. So we can't really look at this and compare it directly to our US because of all the, the differences in their pre and postnatal care, access to care, infant outcomes, and social resources. But it was interesting because it followed the kids for a much longer period of time. It didn't stop at five years like the Washington study. It went to 13 years of age. Mm -hmm. So infants with NAS had higher admission rates than a control group, just like our kids did, 
And they didn't look at um, numbers, they looked at odds ratio. So child abuse had an odds ratio of 21. So no relationship is an odds ratio of one, right? So the fact that the child had NAS and the fact that they were abused, if you have an odds ratio of one, has no relationship whatsoever. We can't, we can't figure out that they're related to one another. But when it's 21, that's off the charts, that there's a relationship between the fact that the child was exposed and then was a victim of child abuse and neglect. So the odds ratio for child abuse was 21. Tr any kind of trauma, like an assault, was 15. Death was 3.3. And mental health and behavioral complaints had an odds ratio of 2.6. We didn't see anything about mental health and behavioral changes in those kids, but that was because we only followed it up to age five, right? So I don't know if Washington is still tracking this data and is going to look at these kids at an older age and then report it out to us, but that would be very interesting, I think, because since they're following them out into those preteen years, they start reporting all these differences in those kids, including mental health. How about THC, right? Because that's out there. Everybody's making it legal. We're going to have to understand how this affects kids. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of great data about it, but we're going to talk about what we do now. It's the third most commonly used drug after alcohol and tobacco, which are both legal. 4% uh, of all 15 to 16 four-year-olds report, self-report using it. 11% of pregnant women, when they, they, they were serum tested, were found to use it. The problem with THC is that it's very lipophilic, which means it's a fat lover. So it's estimated that more than a third of the drug crosses the beta placental barrier and also goes into mom's breast milk in very high concentrations. And another thing that's happened out in the world of THC is that in the last 20 years, the concentration of THC in cannabis has gone from 3% in the 1990s to 8% in 2008, up to 30% for some of the stuff that's out there on the streets right now. So not only is it everywhere now, but it's not the same thing that people used in the 80s. It's like supercharged, okay? So then we worry that the effect on our kids is gonna be worse as well. So there's two studies that are out there. Ottawa Prenatal Perspective Study, which is from the 70s, Maternal Health Practices and Child Development Study, which was from the 80s, that show that there's lasting impacts of prenatal cannabis exposure. That's the question. What it was shown to, to do in those two studies is have effect on fetal growth restriction, exaggerated startle response in infants in terms of sort of their jitteriness, poor habituation to stimulation like light, for sleep patterns, diminished short-term memory in three and four-year-olds. Um, and then in the school-aged children, that data sort of diverges and isn't consistent anymore in terms of there being any difference. There is an increased number of hyperactivity in adolescents and inattention and impaired executive function in adolescents as well. So there are correlations in the adolescents and the school age. The data is not good at all about there being any differences. And in the infants, there's data. When you look in, in uh, September 2018, this took a look in pediatrics at uh, THC in the breast milk. Um, it was measurable in the breast milk in 63% up to six days after mom's last marijuana use. The level of THC in the breast milk was eight times higher than in mom's bloodstream. Because it's lipophilic, it likes fat, so it's going into that breast milk because what? It's full of fat, right? So the concentrations in mom are much lower than the concentrations in her breast milk. And the other thing that's lipophilic in a kid is their brain, right? So highly lipophilic substances not only like your breast milk, but they like to settle down in the brain because that's sort of in its most robust growth phase. So it's, it has more fat content in those first years of life versus us using it as an adult. It doesn't have the same effects. So this showed that 30, this study, Ryan, that was also published in pediatrics, uh, showed that 36% of women use marijuana during pregnancy, 18% of women use marijuana while breastfeeding, and the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommend abstaining from all THC use while breastfeeding because of these high concentrations. And then 
general research shows that just like opioids and just like uh, all of alcohol, it definitely has effects on brain growth and development. So what are the, so that's sort of all the drugs that I'm going to go through today. And a lot of facts about how they affect kids long term and the little data that we do know. But I think it's important because I think it's important for us to understand what research exists out there that quantitates any kind of effects it has for us to be able to intervene. So how about the comorbidities of substance use? We essentially in the last hour and 15 minutes have just looked at what does the substance do, but what else is associated with substance use that may affect our kids and we need to intervene in? So I'm on the Child State Fatality Review Team for the state of Virginia, and a few years ago we looked at unsafe sleep deaths in infants less than one year of age from the year 2009 alone. In 2009 alone, we lost 119 children in the state of Virginia from unsafe sleep. That's much higher than child abuse deaths, right? That's one of the biggest killers of our kids in the Commonwealth of Virginia is unsafe sleep. So 119 infants died in 2009. 46, one in five mothers of the infants, 20%, used drugs or alcohol while pregnant. 46% were prescribed narcotics after the birth of the infant, so theoretically are using those medications after the infant is born. And 57% of the cases involved co-sleeping, and in 26% of those, the adult was impaired by drugs or alcohol at the time of the infant death. So the, now we're looking at comorbidities, right? It's not the substance in the infant, but it's the substance in that environment and how it subsequently affects that infant. And we also looked at then poisoning deaths. So from 2009 to 2013, we looked at 41 children that died from overdoses. 37% of those children were to be under the age of seven. 53% of their caretakers had a history of substance misuse that frequently in that study contributed to the outcome. And all these are all this data is online if you want to get in the weeds. Um, and prescription medications accounted for 68% of those 41 deaths. Six were caused by methadone, six were caused by oxycodone, where the child physically actually got into the drug itself and ingested. And that is an epidemic up the street at our hospital right now. We have lost several children in the last two years from ingestions of narcotics. All right. So how do we protect children and families affected by substance use disorders? So HHS had a report in 2009. So 8 million children live with at least one parent who has abused or is dependent upon drugs or alcohol within the last year. Okay, eight million kids. Those kids are three times more likely to be abused and four times more likely to be neglected. So not because of their exposure, but just because of that environment that they're being raised in. And then National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System. There are 3.3 million reports of child abuse involving six million children. 905,000 cases were founded, 66% were neglect, 60% physical abuse. Parental substance use disorder is a contributing factor in a third to two thirds of those founded cases. That's a lot, right? That's much higher than what our baseline rate of substance use disorder is. So 20 million Americans, or 8% of Americans, we're currently using illicit drugs in 2007. This sort of gives you sort of what those drugs are. 17 million or 7% of Americans are heavy drinkers. So the magnitude of this problem, the visible problem is much smaller than the magnitude of what the actual problem is when you look at national statistics like this in terms of use. Um, the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare from 2005 to 2006 reviewed and published in 2009. They looked at uh, basically sort of what people's approach are to substance exposed um, children. Ten states were review and reviewed in depth and surveyed. States have responded very differently to the concern of increasing drug exposed infants. Um, and states have responded even differently to the interpretation of CAPTA amendments in 2003 requiring that exposed infants be referred to CPS. The report requests five-point intervention in terms of when can we step in and effectively, hopefully, change some of the bad outcomes that have been presented today. So pre-pregnancy, promote awareness of the effects 
of prenatal substance use, including alcohol. 19 of 15, 50 states have public education programs that emphasize harm done by using alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Prenatally, once the mom is pregnant, screen all pregnant women for substance abuse, that expert tool, right? Talk to the moms because it's a time that people are willing to change, right? It's a period of vulnerability and ability to make a conscious decision to try to do something differently. Um, no, right now, no one requires prenatal screening in the country. Um, and 37% of our births are covered by Medicaid. So that certainly could be something that Medicaid required, right? To make you jump through that hoop. And then at birth, test newborns for substance exposure and observe for signs of withdrawal. So right now, we sort of have risk categories for who we test. We don't universally test. When Winchester started universally testing, I think they got a lot more positive results than they anticipated. Um, but I think if you simply put a protocol into place that you stick with, if you don't have intrinsic bias in your testing, so that's why it needs to be really objective standards, and then observe that infant for a long enough period of time to know whether they're gonna go through withdrawal or not. Um, <laughs> I will say that many drugs are missed. Alcohol's not in the bloodstream anymore, and lots of drugs out there, when you do your standard drug screen, don't show up, right? So when you do a drugs, drugs of abuse and their opiates come back negative, does that mean that they haven't taken a narcotic? The only thing our drugs of abuse up the street screens for is naturally occurring opioids. So what is that? Heroin and morphine. It doesn't find semi-synthetic or synthetic opioids. It doesn't find fentanyl. It doesn't find subutex. It doesn't find some of the synthetics like oxycodone. So these drug screens also aren't, are missing the majority of what's out there now. They're only getting a small number. Um, and then neonatally, as this child's developing, development assessment and corresponding provision of services is mandated under Individuals with the Disabilities Act by CAPTA. So, we know that these kids' development may very easily be affected by their exposure. So assessing their development in a stepwise fashion and understanding when it's not proceeding as normal and providing intervention services is the best thing that can happen for that child to mitigate those differences in that child versus another child, to make sure that they're school ready by the time they get to be five years of age. So again, when these families are lost to follow up in the medical system, then none of these things are happening. But they're mandated to happen. So we have to figure out a way to engage those moms to provide on-site services where she can get care and the infants can get care. And then during childhood, there's a need for ongoing provision of coordinated services. The strongest models that exist today are family-centered services where everything happens in one co-located place. These moms, are struggling. They cannot go to 10 different appointments in 10 different places with 10 different places to park or 10 different bus lines to catch, right? We need to coordinate care under one house. Um, and we don't do a good job of tracking at a state level, sort of in terms of, but it's improving now. People are making lots of efforts to try to get that to understand the value of coordinated services. So we recently were involved in a project that was funded by Richmond Memorial Health Foundation. It was called Central, Fam Central Virginia Family Resiliency Project. Um, so we, part we chore, partner with Family Lifeline, who's a home visiting service, and SCAN, who provides parenting. And we did a big training and networking event where Dr. Um, Wolf and Dr. Nelson and myself spoke, and some of our social workers spoke, and our OBs that, deal, that are providing treatment for the moms that have substance use disorder spoke and trained all of our medical providers, our social workers, our home visitors, and the parenting staff at SCAN, and then we opened it up to whoever wanted to come um, so that people have the right information and that people use the right language. Because I think the most frustrating thing to our moms is when people tell them different things. So if a mom says, is this methadone gonna hurt my baby? And the answer from three different providers, from the social worker to the resident to the OB, if the answers are different, then that mom doesn't have any faith in us and, and doesn't trust us to provide ongoing care and to do the right thing for her kids. So we all have to be on the same page about 
what it looks like in terms of neonatal abstinence syndrome, how you appropriately treat it, and what we're worried about in terms of outcome and what interventions are going to help. So this education piece amongst all of us, I think, is critically important for us to get respect and for the mom to feel like what we're saying is valid. Because if we say different things, then she, that, we're going to lose her. And right now, we're already losing her. So that we need to figure out a way to work together and engage. And so referrals in this program can be made at any point during the pregnancy or up to the age of three months in the infant. Um, moms had to be participating in a substance use disorder treatment, so at Motivated VCU or with RBHA. And then moms were offered this menu of home visiting, parenting classes, and a special 14-week curriculum that focuses on attachment, because that is the critical piece, that mom's attachment to that infant. That is the most protective thing for that baby is mom being attached to the, that infant. And then the use of peer mentors, which the peer mentors were actually with us in the planning process, as well as then on the other side when the program was implemented. So what lessons were learned? It was very stressful. So we have this great service to offer, right? But it was very stressful trying to get people to engage in this, beyond what I ever fathomed. So we need comprehensive evidence-based wraparound services Right? So that's what we offered, but we need to co-locate them. And that's, SAMHSA just came out with a report that said the exact <laughs> same thing. You can provide this parenting class, you can provide home visiting, you can provide for mom's treatment, you can provide development assessments of the child, but they all need to happen under the same roof. We can't have the moms going different places for this. So co-location of services is key, and that's, that's what we found, and that's what SAMHSA just found in their report. Recruitment was far more difficult than anticipated, so we had our social workers at VCU referring them, and we have some wonderful social workers. Carly Fees, who works on our newborn nursery, is very engaging, but you need someone doing this full time, right? So the proposal on moving into the future, um, SCAN has hired a behavioral health organizer. So that person is gonna be like mom's new best friend, right? It's a full time job to get them engaged and to eliminate all these barriers of getting all these services in place. And then you need to increase the number of community partners. We thought we were good getting VCU scan and Family Lifeline all on the same page, but we need other people at the table like judicial, because a lot of these moms were in prison when they came into us, right? So we need to be involved with the court system. We need to be involved with the legal side of these cases, as well as child welfare involvement. And then the Virginia, this is my last, the Virginia Neonatal Perinatal Collaborative is a statewide quality initiative that's funded by the General Assembly that's working with BBH, BHHA, March of Dimes, and the Vermont Oxford Network to collect data, to get that data that we don't have from across the state in order to standardize and improve the care and outcomes of people. And the first time that they got together and collected data, 32 out of 57 hospitals in the state of Virginia participated. So there is a big buy-in at the state level driven mostly by neonatologists and the state agencies that are involved to actually better understand exactly what's going on here instead of looking at it sort of from hospital to hospital, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction when these reports come in about these infants. All right, this is our contact information. If we can share anything with anybody, you're welcome to use my slides in terms of looking up that data and sort of having that objective outcome information to share with coworkers, to share with resource people, to even to talk in some kind of terms with moms about what our concerns are. Or if mom says, you know, this is what my kid is doing, and you'll say, well, you know, that's not unexpected. We sometimes see that, but, you know, if we can provide these intervention services, then maybe we can make it better. Yeah. So please use this information, because it takes a long time to go through everything that's out there and sort of pull out what we worry about and what we need to be doing and when we need to be intervening. Um, and it's such a multifactorial thing that I think it will take us a long time um, to get our arms around all the things that should be happening for these families. But the risk is inordinate. Um, and it certainly warrants our attention, especially in this first year of life, to turn some of these outcomes around for these kids and the moms. All right. minutes and Latifa is going to help us with questions but just before that I know that uh, it's until one so I'm sure some of you will have to leave but I just wanted to let you know a few things one uh, I hope everybody has checked in and put your emails down because we're going to email you back with uh, 
survey of the day plus the PowerPoint that she was just presented. So you have all that information in your emails as well. And the other thing is if you look at the back, the Children's Hospital of Richmond uh, at VCU has come with different pamphlets, so do stop by and uh, I will now let Atifa open it up for questions and get out <laughs> So we will open it up to uh, for questions first in the room. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer it. But. So we're having a lot of uh, interest. I know it's been an issue for the schools. I mean, it's traces here as well. With CBD oil and same tablet. Rub it on your, um, you know, your stretch marks. Rub it on your knees. Rub it everywhere else. So are you seeing the kind of same THC levels connected with those products? And then the other product that I'm seeing more of is um, people are showing the chemicals that they're using for relaxation as a natural yep. relaxer. And is that sort of um, THC incognito that people are not right. recognizing? And who, and who knows the concentration? Those. Right. Do you know what I mean? I think we have no idea. So I am not aware, but I am certainly not the THC expert. <laughs> I am not aware that anybody has looked at that. It took us long enough, do you know what I mean, to try to sort of figure out what's in the breast milk. And so I would agree that, you know, a lot of these sort of off-label things that are happening may very well have the same effect. So I think just in terms of sort of my general recommendation, if we're aware that moms are using any kind of THC product, CBD product, then I would not recommend breastfeeding, which is a horrible thing. Do you know what I mean? But these concentrations are so much higher in the breast milk that until you know, or, or at least I would educate them about what the risks are. You can say, we know that this is what happens, and we have no idea what happens when you're rubbing that all over your epidermal skin. Now, mind you, the absorption is going to be much lower than ingestion because epidermal skin versus like mucosal skin, the absorption is nowhere near the same, but I have no idea, especially since we don't know necessarily what the concentration is either. So I think it's very worrisome and people may, people, I don't think people would connect that at all as being a problem. And so I think the most important thing is our ability to sort of educate and say, look, we know that it's a huge problem if you're actually taking it, we don't really know what the problem is with you using it on your skin. Because then at least they'll think through. Yes, um, In your prenatal clinic at VCU, are you offering expert to all the clients that come in for prenatal care? So, yes, for the most part. For right. Part. It's, where's Bergen? So, um, yes, for the most part. And there, there are is a wonderful prenatal clinic under family medicine that works with our moms um, who are substance, do have substance use disorders. So between uh, Caitlin Martin, who's an OBGYN, and then the family practice um, clinic, they do a lot of support once the mom screens positive in terms of on, staying with them through that prenatal process. Um, they've <coughs> hired a PhD psychologist in that clinic. They have a social worker for that clinic. Um, so I think that's why the screening ends up being very effective, because if you can catch them in that early prenatal period and then put those resources forward in terms of a coordinated mm -hmm. care clinic, and they have group meetings. Those moms get together once a week and they do education, and that education can include some of, not your data that I just gave you, do you know what I mean, but some message about that data and what the concerns are. But with them all together, where it's not a sense of judging. Do you know what I mean? That, you know, let us give you all the tools that we possibly can to make this better. So I think it's very important. I think the screening piece is really important. I'm going off of that. Sorry. Yes. The whole thing. You see your name's not like this. This location was on it. To screening all the moms. Um, So I think it's a time and effort issue. So there are so many screening tools in a hospital now that in the old days I would say it was more like you didn't socially want to ask mom those questions, but we ask people everything now, right? So I don't think it's that. I think people have overcome the discomfort of asking really tough questions in the medical setting um, because 
people have implemented screening tools in the emergency department. We screen people for trafficking. Do you know what I mean? So there's lots of very uh, controversial questions that you ask a family, but I think people are getting much better at figuring out a way to approach those in a very respectful fashion. But I think that there's also so, only so many minutes in a day. And so the, medicine has changed a lot since I started practicing because I'm really old. And so <laughs> you used to not have as much paperwork and have more face time with your patient. The system now has a lot more administrative responsibility to it, and that takes up a greater percentage of time. So I always, I can't work anywhere except VCU because I have other people working with me to help with 